I'd like to introduce the author today, J.L. Bud Allen. He's originally from Greenville, South Carolina, was educated in public schools there. He graduated in 1964 from Furman University with a degree in biology. He left his year in Vietnam with the Combat Infantryman Badge, the Silver Star, the Bronze Star, the Air Medal, and the Purple Heart, the Presidential Unit Citation, and other awards. A, life loud, a lifelong uh, learner, he went back to school to obtain his MBA and an MA in public history. He's married to Caroline Davis Alley, and they have two children, Meg and Mike, and four grandchildren. Blood and Carolyn make their home in, on Signal Mountain, Tennessee. And I'd like you to help me welcome Bud Allen, and I'm going to turn the program over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Wow. It, it's really great to see so many out here today. I'm especially honored that we've got some veterans that were there with me uh, during the uh, I Drang Offensive. Uh, if you'd stand up back there in the back, please, service line. And John, where are you? This gentleman back here was with Charlie Company, 2nd Battalion, 7th Cav, one of the luckiest survivors, one of the nine that came out of there that morning uh, after the, you'll learn as we go along. John was one of the uh, real brave guys, one of the, as Joe Galloway calls him, one of God's own lunatics. Uh, who flew those uh, pilots, the, the, flew the helicopters, the H-13s. From Charlie Company, first cap. Two, two, two nine. Uh, I wasn't with you guys, I came in later. Oh, okay. These guys were right there Absolutely. with us there. So, thank you for being here, though. Uh, well, I also uh, thank uh, uh, several people this morning. I, I want to thank the Secretary of State, uh, Trey Hargett, for sponsoring such a series. I think it's wonderful that we... Uh, uh, are doing this. Um, for those of you who might not be aware of it, we really, this is the inaugural uh, program for the library kicking off the 50th commemoration of the Vietnam War, uh, which is going to be a 10 year long celebration sponsored by the federal government, the National Archives, and the Department of Defense. Uh, so over the next 10 years, uh, we're finally going to get welcome home. Uh, to us Vietnam veterans, and it, it's really nice that the Secretary of State has chosen to do it this way. Uh, also want to thank Virginia and the Friends of the Library for having me. Uh, I want to recognize Norm Hill of the Tennessee Historical Commission who brought his, a display out here. Uh, Norm has, has helped us many times with our 2nd Battalion, 7th Cav uh, reunions that we've had here in the past. Uh, he missed the one we had down in Chattanooga this past October. So. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Nice to wel welcome uh, Patrick Henry, our uh, State Historic Preservation Officer, sitting in the back. Uh, and I'm sure I'm leaving off one or two others here that I should recognize, but uh, thank you all, all for being here. Uh, now, let's begin a little bit. Uh, how did we get to Vietnam? We got there uh, because uh, the French got, got out and we went in to kind of fill the vacuum. And we started with advisors. And one of the guys that went over there as part of the first TRIM group that went over to help train the Vietnamese, <coughs> South Vietnamese military, uh, was a gentleman named uh, Robert McDade. And some of these names I'll throw out at you. Uh, we'll come back later. So uh, McDade was one of the first ones that went over in 1954. He was there from 54 to 56 as a young captain as part of those 300-man uh, unit that was sent from the United States to help transition from the French to the Vietnamese and help them create their, their military. Um, and uh, uh, so we ended up there. Uh, we ended up in an advisory role trying to help them uh, uh, have a uh, position, a military position to offset the uh, aggressive uh, <laughs> tactics of the North Vietnamese uh, who decided that they should have a unified country rather than uh, two of them. Uh, they were supported by China and Russia. Uh, we didn't particularly like that. Uh, now one of the things we did as Americans that a lot of people don't really realize is, is uh, South Vietnam was an agrarian economy and it was a Buddhist economy. 
uh, of the Buddhist religion, totally Buddhist. <laughs> so, what we did, uh, Colonel uh, Edward Lansdale, one of uh, the uh, altar boys of uh, Alan Dulles and Secretary of State John Dulles, John Foster Dulles, uh, went over to the Philippines and found out a gentleman named uh, New <coughs> Diem, New Dien Diem, and installed him as president of uh, South Vietnam, and moved, removed the emperor, who was the Buddhist head, removed him as the head of the government. So now we've installed a Catholic leader into a Buddhist country. Uh, if any of this begins to sound a little familiar as we go through some of these things uh, and look at things today, uh, keep that in mind. But we did install this Catholic leader in charge of the Buddhist country. Now, he had a problem. He was Catholic. He didn't, wasn't very familiar with the, the farmers. Uh, he'd come from the upper society. So what we did, we then moved one million people from the north who were French, uh, who had worked for the French, who were Catholic, because they had been the industrial center. So we moved a million Catholics down and gave them South Vietnam. So this immediately set up a religious situation between the Buddhist and the Catholic. And early on in the 1960s, you, you may remember uh, reading something in the paper about the monks burning themselves in the streets of Saigon. And all this was really a protest, a religious protest, trying to get participation in the government. That DM had pretty much cut them out. Throughout this, because we handpicked DM, we, we sent him in, uh, we began backing him. And what we were doing there in Vietnam, we were drawing a line in the sand. Some people can say it's right or it's wrong, but we drew a line in the sand to the communists and said to Russia and to China, no, we're willing to sacrifice, we're willing to fight, we're willing to put our beliefs on the line for it, to, to oppose you. So, good, bad, or indifferent about your feelings about the war, it did have the effect that we never did, Russia's aggression stopped, China's aggression stopped. Korea began backed off. Uh, so <coughs> the, net, the net result is that, that we, by drawing that line and saying other wars would not happen in, in the scale of the <coughs> wars. So that's a little bit about the background. So let's get on with the story we're going to talk about today. July 1st, 1st Cavalry Division was created in Fort Bain, Georgia. It was a brand new concept, brand new concept. They'd been testing it for about three years with bits and pieces, and all of a sudden they came out and decided we've got to have this army and uh, this new concept, we're going to send it to Vietnam. They didn't tell us that up front, so we're going to create this division. So on the 1st of July, the first cab was created in Fort Benning, Georgia. On the 29th of July, it was ordered to Vietnam. My battalion, Part of the 3rd Brigade boarded the USS Rose on 17 August and arrived in Vietnam 30 days later. I learned on board a little bit about what the 7th Cavalry was and who this guy named Gary Owen was. And you'll learn a little bit more about him as we go along. Uh, but uh, we got there. Uh, we arrived at Quinh Yon, which was not a port at the time. Everything had to be offloaded from the ships on the LSTs and then transported to the beach and further loaded on the trucks and transported 60 miles up to the jungle at Antet. We arrived there just as the fall monsoons arrived, uh, which uh, those of us from the south realize it rains sometimes. We just never realize how bad it rained. Uh, and we were over there with slick sole boots, our stateside uh, fatigues and everything. And those boots, you couldn't walk over there in the mud. Uh, we had no jungle boots, had no jungle clothing at the time. So we had moved 60 miles inland to An K. And it's, you can spot it on the map back there. It's halfway between Queen Yon and Clay Coo, right in the middle of the country. There, it's on Plateau. Uh, now, some of the things that we did that's remarkable about the United States Army and the United States of what we could do was we moved. In one month, in the two months' time, we were able to move 18,000 men, 447 helicopters, 3,100 vehicles, 1,900 long tons of supplies, 10,000 miles, uh, and be ready for offensive combat operations. 
in 60 days times. And that's pretty doggone good job. So which uh, year it was? I'm sorry, which year? 1965. Okay. This was July 1965, I'm sorry. All right, my job with the 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry, was the battalion communication officer. Unlike most second lieutenants in the infantry who were down with a line company who never saw anything more than their own men and their maybe company commander, and occasionally they might have glimpsed somebody else, I happened to have a draw the lucky straw. And uh, I was a, a staff officer at the time. So I also had administrative responsibilities for the communication platoon. And that meant that I had to repair the radio repair men. I had the radio operators, <coughs> and I would designate the operators out to the colonels and then the other staff members so that they could communicate. So it was really unusual that as a second lieutenant, I had to be chosen for a job. Uh, it gave me a wide range of viewpoints uh, from which uh, I was able to write this book. In many cases, I was a fly on the wall. In other cases, I was a participant. Now, stop here for just a second. and. Uh, Tell you this, when I graduated from the university, the Army had come out with a brand new program. They called me in April and said, son, we think you're qualified for this new program called a U2 program. Great, Colonel, huh? what's the U2 program? Well, the U2 meant that I would go straight in on active duty from uh, my, as soon as I graduated with my ROTC commission. No further training. I'd only had six weeks of training at the summer camp. Uh, as far as the Army, the real Army, uh, was, uh, and a few years of studying things in school about the Code of Military Justice and a few other dry subjects as we went along. So, anyway, uh, I volunteered for the infantry because I wanted to be out playing Army. There wasn't any war back then, 1964, when I went in, and I thought they could get out, get away from the books for two years and, and have fun out there playing the Army. <coughs> so, I reported on August 9th to the 2nd Infantry Division as a brand new 2nd Lieutenant. I had never had any training, never got any training. I walked right in, reported that uh, Commanding General Nathan Childs, reported to him, thought everything was done. They sent, sent a Jeep up, got me, took me down to the uh, battalion where we were. And uh, I walked into the battalion's out in the field, so they had a rear detachment commander. I didn't know anything. I'd already reported to the general, right? So I walked into the captain and said, Hi, how you doing, bud? Out. And this captain locked my heels up, turned me around four times, sent me out, had me do this five times so I wouldn't have to report properly to the commander. Now, I'll tell you that little dialogue because in 2011, May 2011, I graduated from uh, Middle Tennessee State University. And I'm sitting there that morning, I'm reading the little program and everything, and all of a sudden they said, we're honoring our distinguished alumni today, Major, uh, Lieutenant General uh, Horace G. Pete Taylor. Now, Horace G. Pete Taylor had to been that captain <laughs> that locked my heels up <laughs> that morning. So as soon as we graduated, as soon as we, they broke up the ceremony, I went tearing out across the parking lot to grab him. And I said, General, you don't remember me, but I sure as hell remember you. <laughs> uh, and this comes into play a little bit because it impressed on me the need to report. You had to report. It's the first thing I learned in the Army. If you had to report, you had to report as soon as you could. So, here we are. We're in Vietnam. It's October. It's monsoon season. And we've got this new unit. And we've done a few little flyouts and a few little shakeout things trying to, to get organized. Late October, the 1st Battalion, 33rd North Vietnamese Regiment, that had just come down from Hanoi, attacked the Special Forces Camp at Play Me, or about 19 miles from Play Coo City, right over near the border, the Cambodian border. What they did, they were trying to draw out the Americans, the 1st Cav Division, to fight them. And what began, on the, as it began, as the operation began, they sent our first brigade out there, which was the airborne troops, and they went out there for about uh, 15, 16 days out there. As part of my job, <coughs> I was picked to go out and recon this special forces camp. I was flown out in the Army uh, on a 
fixed, fixed wing caribou uh, that the army no longer has. Landed on a dirt strip. I was scared to death. I mean, I'm going out here and they've been shooting out there. Uh, and it's just been just over. Uh, and I get out there and I'm landing on a dirt strip. First thing I see out there, dead North Vietnamese hanging in, hanging in the concertina wire as they tried to come in. And it smelled terrible. Now, I don't know if you can see from back where you are, but right here is the Plain View Special Forces Camp. Little triangle. They were, they, the Army at the time was using them uh, as, as little outposts to try to draw some reconnaissance. As you can see, there's not a whole lot of buildings out around here. Uh, this is total jungle uh, territory. Uh, right here, this is a uh, landing strip that we landed on. That's the Plain View Special Forces Camp. All the Special Forces Camps were made in that triangle form. Some genius had decided that was the best way to have a defense that you need. The Special Forces Camps were manned by an A-team, an 11 man A-team, commanded by a captain, a first lieutenant executive officer, and 10 uh, or 9 cross-trained uh, senior NCOs. So that's what started things. <coughs> this little attack out here to draw us out. We sent some people out and they began to have a little bit of success. They found some enemy out there in the jungle. They got tired, they got worn out, so they pulled in back and they decided in their infinite wisdom to send the 3rd Brigade, uh, which was my brigade, where the 2nd Battalion, 7th uh, Cavalry was, out into the operation. Now, just before we go out, on November 4th, we have a complete fruit basket turnover. The colonel that was in charge of us and brought us over uh, went up and told General Kennard I quit. Uh, his executive officer, Major Malay, will come into play a little bit later, uh, uh, he, he was transferred to brigade and he became the brigade S3 or operations officer. So all of our institutional leadership was lost at that time. We had a new operations officer, total staff. Brand new, no experience. On the 11th, we were ordered out to play coup to begin the offensive. And they, what they did, they said, areas of operation, they put a battalion in each one of the areas of operation that were not contiguous to each other. So the maps didn't match up. So if you were in this area, your map didn't match the other guy's map. Now, we're out right here, uh, and this left me because the fighting guys flew out. And this left me to bring up all the cooks and bottle washers. And here I am as 23-year-old second lieutenant ready to move a small convoy of supplies. We're getting ready to take it 60 miles up through uh, the Main Yang Pass. Main Yang Pass in 1954, after the Indian Fu, they destroyed uh, 8,000 of the uh, Brute Force Mobile 100 that was part of the French contingent there were destroyed. So I'm getting ready to take six vehicles up through that pass. And uh, that's that's my armament I'm carrying right there in my Ford Five. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, we got there. No problems. Fine. Now, the distances that the cab operated in were vast compared to the traditional Army units that they'd been. Traditionally, you kind of drove your, your vehicles on, on the road. You moved by trails. Out here in the jungle, there weren't any roads. And we moved on huge jungles, and on huge areas by comparison. Now, each ship would carry only six to eight, and we call, we call those, those helicopters ships, uh, even though some of you Navy folks might disagree with that. Uh, <laughs> but, but we went over there, we had the new helicopters carry eight, the old helicopters carried six. So you had to move a force of 100 or 500 men into a landing zone for a battle. It took a lot of those helicopters to get in and get the men on the ground. Uh, yeah. Here's a little bit of the distance, as you can see. Here's Quinyon, where we landed. Here's Ante, where we made our base camp. And here's Camp Holloway, which was our rear logistics support for the area. That was an, that was an Air Force uh, base sitting back there at two core headquarters. Out here's areas Play Me and these places Albany, Columbus, and X-Ray become a little important later on. 
When we first got in, when we first landed, uh, and I got to play through, we, we got on helicopters and flew out to landing zones. Our first one was called Landing Zone Atlanta, and it was way down here. Colonel Hal Moore, we were soldiers once and young, his first landing zone was way down here, a place called Landing Zone Yankee. But on the 14th of November, the 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry, under command of Hal Moore, uh, set foot on this place called Landing Zone X-Ray. And they'd been there about 45 minutes, so they were beginning to get, they had about 150 soldiers on the ground by that time. And uh, all of a sudden, <coughs> one of their young lieutenants named uh, Henry Herrick, uh, his platoon spotted some enemy, and they took off following them and ran right into an ambush and got cut off. And in the movie, we were soldiers once and young. You'll see the story about the Ernie Savage and the Lost Platoon. It's also in the book uh, about them getting cut off and they ended up with only three men that made it out of that platoon that day after three days of being cut off over there. So they're in there on the 14th. They are fighting. Bang, bang, bang. They fight 14th, 15th, and 16th. As this fight is unfolding, the brigade is realizing, uh-oh, we got a lot of problems. We got a tiger by the tail. We better send our troops in there. So they began committing all the forces they could into that landing zone X-ray. And we went in piecemeal. They sent our Bravo company in first. They sent our A company in next. And finally, they sent Charlie company in. And we tried to go in there uh, with, with part of our headquarters elements on the day of the uh, 15th. We could not get in because we hit the river, we couldn't cross the river. So we finally walked in there on the morning of the 16th at LC X-Ray. Now, by then, they've gotten two battalions. They've gotten the 2nd Battalion, 7th Cav, we had 350 men. And they had the 2nd of the 5th Battalion. 2nd of the 5th had uh, about 500 men. They were full, full strength battalion. So we had about 850 men in this landing zone. This is landing zone X-ray. Now, I was not out there as a photographer at that time. Uh, this was taken in April when we went back into X-ray. Way back up here, you can see two men back up there. You can see another three men here. You can see some guys back out here in this little point of trees. I'm standing about halfway in the middle of this landing zone. So by size wise, it was about 700 yards diameter all the way around. It was huge. You can get a lot of ships in there. You can get a lot of them out. So you can get men and, 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 and supplies in there in a hurry in the landing zone x-ray. We were sitting there on the morning of the 17th, landing zone x-ray. We'd stood up all night that night, the 16th, waiting on an attack that never came. We were scared. The landing zone smelled terrible. It was a dead body, dead and all fit and leaves been all over the area there were estimated over 600 of them out there dead and not been retrieved. Uh, you had napalm, you had uh, all the cordite was continually firing. The uh, howitzers, the H&I howitzers were continually firing. So you had a continuous bad smell, bad place to be. Nobody slept that night, obviously, the 16th. So here we are on the morning of the 17th. We're, we're up, guys are making their coffee. They're beginning to move around just a little bit. One guy in Foxhole keep an eye out. Radio rings. <coughs> Pardon me, being a communications officer, I'm standing there and they asked for six. Six is the military uh, designation for your commander. So I handed it to Colonel McDade, Colonel Bob McDade, the guy that had been over there the very first time in 1954 as part of the training mission. Well, the last thing Bob McDay had ever commanded was a training company in 1953. And all of a sudden, he was our new tax commander. And so our brigade commander, Colonel Thomas Brown, uh, said to him, and, and also uh, Colonel Tully, standing there nearby, said, gentlemen, we've got a big 52 strike coming in on top of you, right where you are. You've got four hours to move. Uh-oh. We need four hours to move. Yep, four hours to move. And where are we going? Well, we'll get to that in just a second. I want to read you this from Hal Moore's quote. There's no such thing as closure for soldiers who have survived the war. They have an obligation. 
the sacred duty to remember those who fell in battle beside them all their days and to bear witness to the insanity that is war. Now, how more had been the commander? Now, we're going to move to the second part of this battle. Because on that first, first battle there with Colonel Moore, there were three days worth of combat, 89 men killed, a little over 100 men wounded. Now, this is landing zone Albany, right here. Doesn't look near as big as that LZ X ray, does it? Tiny little place. We'd never seen it. It was on a map. Not a real good map. It was one over 50,000 uh, map at the time. We didn't have any maps. The maps we had were the ones that Hal Moore's unit had left. We had three maps and a whole battalion. So we're getting ready to make a march to this place right here. But the coordinates of it were given us this little place right over here, a little bit smaller. It creates a little bit of confusion later on as we go along. Now, this is actually where we are on the morning of 17th. Our orders are, gentlemen, here's what I want you to do. I want the 2nd Battalion, 5th uh, Cav, to leave and go here to LZ Columbus. LZ Columbus is where there were two artillery batteries there. Uh, it was a large <coughs> landing zone. Very large landing zone. Now, as soon as you get here, on the 2nd and the 7th to break off and go here to this landing zone, Albany. Years later, I've always wondered why and where we split our forces in the middle of a, a large enemy uh, concentration in the area. But nevertheless, we do split our forces. Now, how are we going to move in this length of time? We're going to grab everybody up. We've got 850 guys to move off this landing zone down here. And we've got to go over here. And part of us got to go up here. Well, the colonel stick his heads together. They decided we'll move in column of two. Okay? So we got 850. You can get that down to uh, 425, half on each side. 100 yards apart. And how are we going? We're going through the jungle. Never been there before? No, uh uh. But we got a map, a couple of maps. Oh, by the way, we've got a brand new recon lieutenant uh, trying to read the, the, the maps for us. But we managed to go in column of two all the way up to here in a hurry. Now, situation report right there uh, before we leave. No water resupply that morning. Uh, no ammo resupply. No removal of any excess uh, detritus on the battlefield. No extra gear. No removal of any extra ammo or anything. You guys from headquarters company, y'all just grab it all up and carry it because you're not combatants anyway. You got A, B, and C, and D companies, or the soldiers. You guys are the clerks and bottle washers. Y'all just carry the stuff. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, so I happen to have a 45 pound uh, 292 antenna carry that day. It was in kind of suitcase, canvas, canvas suitcase to carry, was what I would carry. Anyway, we make it up here, column of twos, no problem. <clears throat> Pardon me. We're in this column of two. We'll break it off. And we start up towards here. Column of two. Now the jungle right in here goes from this had been elephant grass and a little bit of a little bit of scrub oak and a little bit of low grass. But when we turn the corner here. We hit triple canopy jungle. So now we got triple canopy jungle. We don't know how far out here. This was four kilometers. This is three kilometers. It's 100 degrees. We got no water. We all overloaded uh, and hadn't slept in three days. So, and we're, 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 up, we're up out here with new leaders and we're the new guys. So, here we're making our march. Heading along. And all of a sudden, just as we get to about to here, 
I knew Rick Opportunity steps on this dude laying right there. And uh, when he steps on him, uh, our, his platoon sergeant uh, looks and steps on another one. There's two of them. And they captured, jump on them. Got them stopped. Okay? So we got this column of two. We got two prisoners out here. And what's happening right here, as soon as that happens, the colonel orders a halt. So now we're strung out down here, somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 yards. We got part of us over here, part of us over here. And we, we stop. We stop while the colonel and the staff, the new guys, all come up and begin interrogating these guys. What, where are you from? All this stuff. Well, they said they were from this other landing zone, and they said that they just deserves. What they didn't see was that what we didn't see was the three guys that were also with these guys that escaped back to their unit, which happened to be the 1st Battalion, 33rd North Vietnamese Infantry. Uh, so, Situation we find ourselves in, excuse me. Situation we're in, this landing zone we're going to, is kind of shaped like this, as you saw up there in, in, in the original diagram. It's a little side and it's a big side that we're going to. And where, where we are at that moment in time, where did they capture these two? They captured these two guys right here. So our column of two is ah, situated all back in here. Now we're strung out about 600 yards from here to here. So comes up here, he stops the column for about 10, 15 minutes while they're trying to interrogate these guys. They're not getting anywhere. We're back there in the back. Say, God, I'm not even there yet. Are we there yet? We're tired, we're hungry, they're going to have water for us when we get to this new place. We think, we're hoping. Uh, now, Colonel looks over through here, and what does he see? A clearing. Well, maybe that's a clearing. So, what he's looking at is this right here. So, the Colonel and his staff say, Well, let's go out here and see if this is the landing zone. So, they leave these guys back here, and they start out here. And right through here, and you didn't see it much on the die on the picture I had. But there's a copse of trees runs across, cuts these two places apart. They walk out into the middle of these trees here. So we've got now we've got the battalion commander, the executive officer, the operations officer, uh, the S2, the intelligence officer, all right out. Right out in here, and all their radio operators, so there's about 15, 18 guys walking out here. <coughs> and all of a sudden, Major Henry, who had been a pilot, and the only one that knew what a landing zone really had looked like, was with these guys. He's an executive officer. He looks over here and he says, Oh, wait, well, this is bigger. This must be the landing zone. These coordinates must have been off just a little bit. So, this is here. In the meantime, Recon, who had been up here capturing these guys, they start across this field here to secure what they think is the landing zone. See, as they start across, all of a sudden, there's a kaboom, kaboom, and way back over in here, what we hear is mortars, it's two mortar rounds being fired, 60 millimeters, and bang, they land right here in the middle of this little field, bang, bang. And about the time that happens, all hell breaks loose. Right over in here. But what's happened, because we've been back in here, we were tired, we sat down. We had no flank security, because we had to move in a hurry. We were in column of twos. We had no communication between these two right here. Oh, and right before those mortars got there, the colonel decided, let's call the company commanders all forward. So, now we've got all the company commanders up here 
All the battalion leaders up here were totally stuck up here. In the meantime, the 625 of the North Vietnamese 133rd are all out in here. They're in the trees, they're in hiding holes, they're in the grass, they're literally all over us. And we're laying there smoking cigarettes, talking, you know, it's time to go. And we don't know that we're sitting right beside one of these guys. No idea until all of a sudden those mortar rounds go off. And when they go off, it starts the attack. And it just starts rattling right down the line back here. And they get in behind here, and our training company back here, George Forrest, they got cut off. They get cut off right in here. So all of a sudden, this group up here is cut off with all the leaders are up here. And what we got back here is we got six second lieutenants that have never been in combat before, two leaders. And within minutes, uh, five of the six are either killed or totally out of action with, with wounds. So I'm the only guy back in here, aside from one other lieutenant, trying to figure out what in the world is going on here. Other than we're getting a lot of people killed, and we don't know where they are or where they're coming from. Now, we got untrained troops, because we just started the 1st of July and threw us together. So we haven't had any practice in. So what does that mean? You take that kid from Philadelphia, he's never been hunting before, he was shooting. He starts shooting himself. He can't see what he's looking at. So we get shot at from behind. We get shot at from the, by the enemy from on top. Every time you gather a group together, uh, a hand grenade comes in or a mortar round lands in and takes out two or three. So you can't gather anybody to just find out where we're supposed to be. I found one radio at work. I go on the radio and I finally got a major junior at the checking box. I said, sir, where the hell are you? We need some help back here. He said, Lieutenant, do the best you can. We got our hands full up here. What happened up here, right about that same time, was this unit called the, uh, the 8th of the 66th North Vietnamese Regiment. And they had a little over 600 men. And they attacked right through here. And they were about to overrun, they were about to overrun this group up here. And then they came over here, and they came in and cut this, this company that was cut off, it was completely isolated. And right in here is where we had 155 Americans killed that day. 134 more of us wounded. We're in triple canopy jungle. It's dark in places. Uh, we're back in here. And Charlie Company was, was you don't remember your family, but y'all were back up in this area somewhere. <laughs> and another platoon was back in here, and one platoon was over here, and Pujalas platoon was over here. Pujalas and Jeanette were here and here, and Ron Miller and Lieutenant All were, were these two platoon leaders. Uh, I don't know their, which platoon numbers they were. Jeanette was the fourth platoon leader, I know that. I think that all, I think that Miller was the first platoon leader. Uh, but anyway, they're back up in here and they just get absolutely sliced and diced. Out of their 89 men they had for, uh, in the field that day, and they, oh, they had a brand new company commander too, Pat Fessmeyer. Uh, out there, 89 men, I think you had nine left for, for business the next morning. So, you got this mess going on up here. It's going on all over. <coughs> it's getting dark, and that's about five o'clock, as far as I'm concerned, back in here. It's real dark back here. And all of a sudden, what happens? These guys up here decided it's so confusing, they're trying to figure out where their people, where their men are. And they can't figure out, they finally get an A1E, two A1E uh, planes come in. And they're prop driven, they have 20 millimeter cannons on and they're carrying napalm. And they bring them in, they circle around, and they start right in here making a run. Bang, 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 bang. 
And when, that, when, when, when those rounds hit the trees and the leaves in the trees, it sounded like rain, heavy rain hitting or hail hitting those trees. And then all of a sudden you hear the roar. About a few seconds later, the, the cannons going up. So they're making a couple of strafing runs in here trying to keep trying to keep these guys at bay. And then they decide to drop the napalm. The way they dropped the napalm was right, right in here. And they take out some of our guys, take out part of the A Company, uh, one of the students of the A Company, got some of the Charlie Company guys. Uh, so now we're being shot at by the enemy over here, and we've got our own guys up here coming in this way on top of it. It's dark. Lieutenant Butch All gets down to me. It's Butch, where the hell are we? We're pinned down with a machine gun. And Butch gets down with his radio operator, and I got about five people with him. And Butch says, I think, I think we gotta go this way. We're somewhere back in here. He says, okay, Butch, let's go. So Butch takes off into the tall grass. And he was supposed to go about five yards and then and then holler out a number, and then we're going to leapfrog over him and, and just leapfrog our way that we, we hooked up with these guys, finally. But never heard anything from Butch. Butch got taken out with machine gun bullets right off the bat, but Butch is dead. So now you talk about panic. I'm sitting here totally cut off. I'm totally exhausted. The six guys we had with us had vanished like quake. They're gone. Because they don't know me, I don't know them, I don't know what unit they were with, because we were all mixed up in there. Finally, I'm crawling around in here and I find it, I find some guys from headquarters company. I find a guy named Garrett Lee. And Garrett Lee was been a guy with me in the first of the night that I know. I used to have duty officers. He was an S the intelligence clerk. Garrett was shot at real bad, real bad. And I got to him. I found a couple other guys that were wounded a little bit. I said, guys, you gotta help me. We gotta see if we can get him to some aid. He's bleeding, he's about to bleed out. So we try, try to move Gary. <coughs> we're moving Gary, and he's screaming because every time he's moving, he's in such pain. And we're trying to move him just a little bit. About that time, here come one day when he's in here again. It scares the hell out of those two guys. They dropped Gary, and they disappeared. So I never saw them again. Didn't know who they were to start with. Because me and Garrett, Garrett is shot up terrible. Garrett weighs about 220 pounds, thereabouts. He's about 6'4, big guy. Uh, shot up. I try to carry him. I can't pick him up. I, he's screaming every time you touch him. So I said, okay, Garrett, if you'll hold on to my shirt, I'll try to see if I can crawl over you and, and, and drag you a little bit. And we tried that a little bit. He passed out. He, Lost consciousness. So I realized we weren't going to be able to move anywhere. Had no, no medical anything. Uh, by then, uh, I can't remember if I had my shirt on or off because I'd used it for doing some bandaging around. Uh, they wounded guys. So anyway, Garrett passes out. There's nothing we can do, nothing I can do for him. So I lay there with him beside him as we get shot at because he died. Maybe 30 seconds, maybe it's three minutes. Garrett died. Good guy, lost. Now I'm all by myself. Can't find anybody. We're getting the daylight shot out of us. All of a sudden, I hear this way off in the distance. Ka boom, ka boom, ka boom. Ka boom, ka boom, ka boom. A few seconds later, I hear this shh, shh, shh. You guys have been on the ground, I know that that sound is incoming. It ain't out for it is incoming. And then crack, crack, crack. So all of a sudden, we're getting shot at here. We got our own artillery now coming in on top of us. Because these guys up here are trying to adjust our artillery, and they don't know where anybody is back here. So we got airplanes shooting at us. We got uh, 1,200 enemy shooting at us. Uh, and we got our own guys shooting at us uh, from the top and the bottom. They don't get much worse than this. And I might hear that artillery coming in. I crawl my way for a place to get out of it. Hide and I fall into a ditch. I fall into a little bitty ditch. And it's a little ditch. As I fall in there, I find five wounded Americans, GIs. I didn't know who they were. 
Then they were accompanied with, uh, they know the names. There were five of them. One guy had an eyeball shot out. They were cleaning and painting down here. He had a bandage over his eye. And his eye was down here and he was sweating. Said, sir, I can see, sir, I can see, I can see. Somehow he knew I was an officer. I don't know that I had a shirt on at that time. Uh, and I had, I don't remember my steel pocket to go to. Anyway, we're in this ditch, five of us. Scared to death. They're all wounded. All five of them were shot up real bad. And, and, and we got this artillery coming in right on top of us. And it's like, okay, we have one chance, maybe. I don't know where these guys are up here. But I know that artillery is coming from LZ Columbus, where we just had been way back here. And it's about three clicks back here, two or three clicks back here. So we crawl up that ditch. I said, guys, can you move? They said, yes, we move. I said, all right. If you move up there, what we're going to do, we're going to try and get the artillery base and see if we can get in. It's pitch dark where we are now. Pitch dark at night. We crawl up that little ditch. There is a little glimmer of light that you can see through the trees. We crawl up that ditch and hit a briar patch. Big briar patch. I mean, it's, it's what kind of you don't like to know about briar patches. It's thick and I'm crawling through and I stick my head in and I see something down there at the foot. I look at him like, oh my God. I freeze. It's a chewing gum wrapper. Middle of the jump, chewing gum wrapper. Now look right beside is a human turd, a little. And I'm like, oh God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just stand there waiting for the bullet to hit me, because I know I'm gonna get killed any second. But it never comes. Turned out that's where one of them had been hiding as they were moving in to get on top of us. So we were able to get through that bar patch and get on past them and guiding only on the sound of the, of the artillery that evening. We got into the outer base out, outside the perimeter of the artillery where we could hear them changing out the, the brass and, and, and loading the weapons. Too dangerous to try to go in because, uh, unbeknownst to us, there did some other action <laughs> uh, that, at that base, this artillery base back here where we are now. They had sent a company out trying to reinforce us up here. They had hit this rear company back here that we never saw. They tried to get here. Those enemy had gotten in between them and they kicked this company back. So now they're back all hunkered in ready to shoot anything that moves, and we're outside the perimeter. So we sat there, it was totally dark that night. We're in broom sage, just little berms. Got behind the berms. Okay, guys, here's what we're gonna do. Everybody hold, hold hands, put your head in my lap. We can't go in for daylight. We all held hands, we all had the head in my lap, and we sat there the rest of that night, listening. Sounds from the night. Middle of the jungle, you're hearing the firing going. You also hear little rattling sounds. You don't know is that a rat? Is it a rabbit? Is it a lion? Because we have tigers out out in that area. The jungle. But we don't know what it is. Or is it North Vietnamese looking for? Is it North Vietnamese getting ready to attack here? We don't know. Dawn finally comes. We've heard all these noises. I leave the guys, I leave the guys on one side of the perimeter, went over the other side of the perimeter, called got an officer up, up to the edge of the perimeter, said, please hold fire. I got wounded, I'm getting ready to bring in. I told them who I was. She said, okay, they held fire, went back, got my men. We all we all are moving in. We're going into the perimeter. We're finally gonna be safe. We're going in. They're sitting there all ready with their guns too, not knowing if we're going who we are. You see these five guys we're linking in bad. And all of a sudden one of them hits a trip flare. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> because the trip flare goes up, smoke goes up, we all hit the ground and, and we're just, my God, I'm waiting this close and all of a sudden, <laughs> nope, they held their fire, fortunately. So we were able to get back up and they came out and helped us get in. We ended up getting uh, put onto helicopters from there. Got sent back to this place called Camp Holloway, our logistics place. 
Uh, and at that time, I got, we got back there. Uh, I said, well, I met one of our guys. I said, sir, you got to get me a helicopter. I've got to report the brigade. I'm thinking I'm the only guy alive out of this whole bunch. I know where they are. But you got to get me to brigade so I can look at a map and tell these people. So they fly me out to brigade headquarters. I get to brigade headquarters. By now, I've got somebody gave me a shirt. I, I covered blood, had to shave in several days. Uh, and I walk into the brigade headquarters tent. And here's this Major Malay. Major Malay had been our executive officer. And when you read my book, you'll see what a nice guy Major Malay was in, in having marbles he had. But he walks out and appears to me babbling to the NCOs about showing me a map. He takes a look at me and he says, Look at what the hell are you doing here? You're a total disgrace, the Army. You're out of uniform. You shouldn't be here at all. But, but sir, I got to show them the map, and then now you get the hell out of here. So, yes, sir. So I walk out, look the map, show the sergeant where, where we were. I walk out, totally close. I'm still half deaf because I can't hear from all the noise of that night before. And uh, I figured, well, I guess I reported. I guess I finally reported. So I go get on the helicopter and fly back to Camp Holloway. Get back and, and sleep for 24 straight hours before I get to join my unit back out, uh, back out in, in, in the field. Now, the, the story was, now, this is the morning, this is the morning of the 18th, dawn of the 18th. I'm not there. This was taken by our forward air controller, uh, Captain Air Force Captain. And these are the survivors uh, getting together, trying to find each other. Now, we get back to base camp. Three days later, I become the company commander of headquarters company. 23rd November, at age 23. I was the youngest company commander in Vietnam at that time, as a second lieutenant. It was my duty to write those letters. Dear Mrs. Jenkins, the Secretary of Army regrets to inform you that your husband has been killed. Ordinance such and such. Sergeant Fred Jenkins, Frogmore, South Carolina. Toon Sergeant, Melvin Gunner, Vincent, Alabama. Spec 4, Joe Kosikowski, Lincoln Park, Michigan. Spec 4, David Mendoza, Cleveland, Ohio. Spec 4, Kenneth Bullard, Auburn, Pennsylvania. Spec 4, Donald Peterson, Chicago, Illinois. Spec 4, Charlie Henders, Lakey, West Virginia. PFC, Charles Collins, Holly Springs, North Carolina. PFC, Charles Moore, Columbus, Ohio. PFC, William Pleasant, Jersey City, Jersey, New Jersey. Spec 4, Elwood Davis, Salineville, Ohio. Spec 4, Alpha Jackson, Houston, Texas. Spec 4, James Holden, Millsboro, Delaware. Spec 4, Tommy Berlisle, London, Ohio. Captain Harold McCarn. Salisbury, North Carolina. Platoon Sergeant Charles Story, Birmingham, Alabama. Master Sergeant Charles Bess, Bass, Winterset, Iowa. And the last, Spec 4 Garrett Lee, Chicago, Illinois. There's no such thing as closure for soldiers who survived the war. They have an obligation, a sacred duty, to remember those who fell in battle beside them all their days, and to bear witness to the insanity of this war, effectively. 